All right, good morning, and uh, thanks to all of you for being out here uh, at 8 a.m. I sort of winced at the time slot, but a lot of you are farmers anyway, so you're used to getting up early. Um, which brings me to, I want to put two caveats, two warnings at the beginning of this talk. Uh, the first one is that I am going to be saying some pretty negative things about agriculture, and which is ironic after Joel's wonderful day that he spent with us yesterday. Uh, but, and I want to make it clear that I am talking about a culture based on agriculture and not about farmers. That I'm not dissing farmers. I mean, as the cliche goes, some of my best friends are definitely farmers. So I just want it to be understood that I'm talking about the, the social and political and economic and eco ecological consequences of agriculture and not about farmers. Uh, and then the other thing I want to point out, want to start with, is just to let you know that this talk starts out negative and it gets worse. <laughs> but being permaculture, I promise you that by the end, we will return to a good place and end with solutions. So we're going to be taking, in other words, we're going to be taking a trip deep into the kingdom of Mordor, uh, but I promise you that by the end, we will return happy in the sunshine at the Shire uh, when we're done. So, this came to me when my wife and I were traveling for a couple of years. We, we had been living in Portland, Oregon. We didn't really want to be there anymore, we, and, but we didn't know where we wanted to go. And my wife pointed out to me that since I travel for so much of my work, that first she said, well, so we could live anywhere. And I kind of, yeah, that, that's cool. We could live anywhere. And then she said, that means we don't have to live anywhere. And we decided to be nomadic, or, or what actually turned out to be migratory. We developed a migration pattern um, over the year. And I learned a lot from doing that. And where, where this, these pieces came together for me was we were in Montana uh, near Billings, and we decided to go to one of the great American battlefields. I'd never been to, to any of the real, the, battle, the various battlefields in the US. So we went to the Little Bighorn, or what's known as the, the site of Custer's Last Stand. And I really didn't understand what, what that day was going to mean to me. That we were given a tour by a ranger who just, he was one of the most eloquent and dramatic speakers that I have ever been around. He really, he painted such a picture because he had, he had the scene right in front of him. He had the, the Wolf Mountains where Sitting Bull had had his vision that started it all. He had the Deep Creek Ravine, which was where the last of Custer's men died. Um, he had the scene right in front of him. And what, what the story that he painted was really that, that it, was a, it was a profound change for, for America and in particular for the, the Native Americans. That, I, we've all heard, you know, the story is that, you know, that there were no survivors of Custer's Last Stand, which of course there were, they just were Native Americans rather than, than U.S. Army soldiers. Uh, and the Park Service is trying to do a little better job with that story now. And I, I just I want to give you a little bit of background that in 1868, the Fort Laramie Treaty was signed, which created an enormous Indian reservation uh, that covered major parts of these very large states. And there was the, the Great Sioux Reservation was at the heart of it, and that was where the U.S. government hoped that most Native people would settle and learn to farm and go to schools and, and really become Americanized. But there were other wilder areas that the various people who lived there, the Lakota and the Oglala and the Arikara and the Cheyenne and the Arapaho, could practice their Native, their traditional ways of life. And the treaty said, and I'm going to read this just to make sure I get it right, um, that there were the unceded Air Indian territories, which was a piece of northern Wyoming, that the treaty declared no white person or persons shall be permitted to settle upon or occupy in perpetuity. So that was to be the place that the native people could practice their traditional ways forever and live their traditional lifestyle. In 1874, gold was discovered in the Black Hills, which was part of this, this land, and attracted uh, white and African-American settlers by the thousands. The U.S. Army actually did try to enforce the treaty for a while and push them out, but, but it was gold. You know, it, it has an utterly magnetic draw that, that apparently we can't resist. And so thousands of settlers came into this, this land, and a number of the great warrior chiefs of these people became really angry at this. Um, Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, the Hunk Papa leader, Gaul, and took their people out 
into the unceded territories and up into the Wolf Mountains. And they were, a number of them were then gathered up by the US Army and brought back to the reservation. More of them left. This went on for a number of years. Uh, and finally, in 1876, uh, General Phil Sheridan and one of his, his colonels, Custer, and various others came out to try and round these people up and bring them back to the reservation. Sitting Bull was out in the Wolf Mountains, and he was on, did a sun dance, a, a very uh, extreme ceremony, in which he had a vision of headless US Army soldiers falling from the sky like grasshoppers. And he felt that this was a, a good omen for battle. He gathered together about 7,000 people, men, women, and children, and they formed a temporary encampment on the banks of the Little Bighorn River. And this is what Custer came upon. And although he only had a few hundred troops with him, uh, he mistook the normal noise and smoke and dust um, of this village. He'd never seen a village this big, 7,000 people was enormous. And he misunderstood and thought that they were breaking camp because of all the dust and smoke that was going on. So he decided it's now or never, it's time to attack, and you know, the consequences that we all, we all know about happened after that. And supposedly there were no survivors, but obviously, as I said, there were. This is a painting done by a Lakota man named Kicking Bear uh, a few years after the battle, uh, of the battle scene itself. And we were looking across this, and the, the army has, or the, the US government has done a better job. At first, they only had the headstones where the various US army soldiers fell, like this is Custer's. But in, over the last couple of decades, they have located the places where the various uh, Native American warriors' bodies were found and have indicated where those were. And I don't know if you can read the print on this, but what it says is that this is where, close at hand, a Cheyenne warrior fell defending his people's way of life. And this, this was really what, what this battle was about. Was this was the end of the way of life for a lot of Native Americans because the US government was so humiliated by this defeat that they brought in thousands more troops. And they gathered up these people and forced them onto the reservation or drove them into Canada or starved them or killed them. So it was really one of those cases where, where the Native people won the war, won the battle, but they lost the war. And the ranger pointed out to us you know, that there, there, this was a, a migratory lifestyle, and, and my wife and I were leading this kind of lifestyle at, the point, at this point, and we really came to understand what it was like to have a huge territory to roam over. But the, the ranger had pointed out that these, these people were the freest people on earth, that they, they had, had freedoms that we, that we just can't imagine in our, in our ownership of land. And I was looking over this landscape. I spent a lot of time there, and I understood how lush and abundant these grasslands were with, with herds of millions of, butter, of, of buffalo. The, a herd of two million buffalo was not unusual at all. And I was seeing in Yellowstone Park herds of 1,500 or 2,000, and these were really pretty impressive. So we understood how abundant and rich this land was. And as, as I was looking over it, and now it's got fences and roads and houses and telephone poles, and it's overgrazed and it's, it's covered with domesticated animal. And I just, I just found myself thinking, why did we have to take it all? And, and by we, I mean my people, um, European descended Americans. Um, I know that not everyone is of that descent here, but I'm, I'm speaking of my people. Why did we have to take every bit of it? Why, did, why could we have not left you know, the unceded territories or something? And, and this really began getting me thinking uh, about what it is in our culture that, that makes us need to not leave anything for anyone else. And it's, there's really a fundamental split that occurred, well, it, it really was, was crystallized about 10,000 years ago, and that was the split between hunter-gatherers or foraging people and farming people. That I, I think a, a, a people not dependent on agriculture, a people who know that it's wild land that sustains them have a completely way of, different way of being in the world in which they know that it is, it is the wild that takes care of them. And for a farming people, for an agricultural people, the wild is where the bad stuff comes from. The wild is where the deer who eat your crops and the raccoons who eat your crops and the diseases and the pests all come from. That, that's what the wild means to us. But in particular, it's wild people that we're afraid of. Because Sitting Bull and his people, they didn't need American laws. They didn't need the school system. They didn't need farming. They didn't need to own land. They didn't, there was nothing that, that America, that, that the government, that we, my people, could offer them. 
And that's terrifying to a domesticated people, that there are wild people out there who don't need anything from you. You can't co-opt them. The only thing you can do is kill them because there's, there's, there's no way to stop your fear of them. And that's, that's really what, what, where that schism comes from. That agriculture supposedly is the domestication of plants and animals, the domestication of cattle and pigs and corn and all of that. When I look at my dog, who is a supposedly domesticated animal, she is so much wilder than I am. You know, agriculture is really the domestication of us. We are the most domesticated animal of all. And it's that wildness that we've lost, and that's what I was feeling in this, that agriculture is really the domestication of the human species. And I want to go into that a little bit, just how, how this came about and what it's done to us, and where this came from. So, so it, it pays, I think, to look at how agriculture got started. And there, there are a couple of, of theories about how, how we came down the road of agriculture. The two major ones are, the, the first one is that we found places uh, 15,000, well, long ago, many, many thousands of years ago, places of abundance, places that were particularly fertile, like the Fertile Crescent, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates. And we hung out there, and they were rich and wonderful and lush places to be, and so we had lots of children, because that's what biological abundance does. And gradually our populations outstripped the resource base, and we had to somehow intensify food production to survive, and so we came up with agriculture. So that's the, the first theory, kind of, is that life was really good in these places, but you know, then, then as we outstripped the resource base, things got bad. So I, I think of this as the life was good but got bad theory of agriculture. And then the second theory of the, of the origins of agriculture was that we were making a pretty good living all sorts of different places, that as hunter-gatherers, um, you can pretty much always find food somewhere, even in droughts, even in bad years. Um, a, a skilled hunter-gatherer can always find food. So we were doing okay, but then the climate changed, and we know this did happen about 11,000 years ago, and it got much colder uh, and drier. And so, again, we had to then intensify food production because the food was going away, and that was the dawn of agriculture. So these are the two theories that life was good and got bad, or life was okay and got bad, but it's, it's basically that life got bad, and we had to come up with agriculture. So agriculture is grounded from its beginning in fear and scarcity, that, that things were going bad for us, and we had to come up with a solution. And what's interesting about the dawn of agriculture is that that all the pieces of agriculture had been there for many, many thousands of years. If you look at the, the fundamental elements that are necessary for agriculture, the first one is simply food gathering, and all animals do that. We're skilled at gathering food, just picking stuff, hunting things. The second one is the controlled use of fire, which is the principal way that human beings have cleared land pretty much up until the fossil fuel age. And we've had controlled use of fire for about 800,000 years. So that's a really old technology. Then there is plant tending, which people have been doing clearly from way before agriculture. It does not take very much intelligence to understand that if you pull a bulb out of the ground and you put it back into the ground somewhere else, it's going to grow. And if you look at traditional plant tenders, the native people of California in particular have been really well studied. They were geniuses at plant tending not domesticating. This photo is a group of native Californian uh, Americans taking care of wild tobacco. Not domesticated tobacco, but wild tobacco. Um, so we know that plants and animals were tended without being domesticated for quite some time. You know, if, I mean, if you've got a great fruit tree, you're going to tell your kids not to break the branches and you're going to pull the weeds away from it. It's just, it doesn't require a civilization to, to know that. And then the third was irrigation. There are ancient irrigation systems that predate agriculture that were bringing water to non-domesticated plants. So those are all the major elements of agriculture. And they've been there for way before the dawn of agriculture, at least 30, 40, 50,000 years and, and probably more. So what probably happened, one of the things that happened was the most recent part of the brain, a portion of the neocortex, developed somewhere between 40,000 and 70,000 years ago. And this is the part of the brain that allows us to do symbolic thought. That, in other words, before this part of the brain evolved, if an owl flew by, it was an owl. And you understood because you understood bird language, you knew that it came from here and it was going there. And you, know, you understood that much about it. But it was an owl. And after 
the revolution in symbols, an owl flying by could have meaning. It could be a portent. It could mean someone's going to die, or it could be a symbol of wisdom, or all those things that, that owls are to us now. So after the revolution of symbols, we became meaning makers. We, we really changed the way that we, that we lived on the earth. And agriculture at some point came around after that. So some pieces were necessary and a, a part of our development was probably necessary. And if you look at when the first art starts appearing, the first complex art, it is about 40,000 years old or so. These Venus figures from a cave in Schwabia, about 30 in Germany, 38,000 years ago. Chauvet cave paintings on the lower left there uh, from 28,000 years ago. So art begins to appear about the same time, sophisticated art or complex art appears about the same time that this portion of the brain evolved. So we were developing a culture then. So in this missing 30,000 years or so, 50,000, very long time, very complex cultures were arising that were not agricultural people. Now I'm, I'm showing some photos here, uh, a couple of places from the, the, up at the top of the Hopewell people who lived from Pennsylvania um, or Ohio out to Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and they were there for thousands of years as a horticultural people, not so much an agricultural people. Uh, and that's what I want to focus on a little bit, is, is the different types of ways that people can be on this planet. There, a anthropologists divide human beings into three major cultures. Uh, it turns out that you can divide people up according to, say, how they build their houses or their clothing or their sexual practices or whatever, and you don't get very good divisions. They're not very clear. But if you divide people up according to how they get their food, you get some very, very clear cultural divisions and wildly different practices among those cultures. And the three major cultures then are foraging or hunter-gatherer peoples, people who gather, go out and hunt their food, gather their food, pretty much the same way animals always have. Um, animals like us. Then there are horticultural people, uh, which are just, to, I'm going to go into a little more detail about this later, but it's essentially gardeners rather than farmers. Uh, a little bit of domestication, but also a lot of wild tending as well. So a kind of midpoint between horticultural or between agricultural people and foraging hunter-gatherer people. And then there are agricultural people where we've got domestication and we are transforming whole landscapes to become food producing systems, really taking them out of the ecosystem and turning them into the, the techno system. So let's look at how agriculture spread then, because it's, it's, it also is a pretty interesting story that if you look at the major spreading centers of agriculture, there are places where crops like bananas or yams or potatoes or beans were grown. But the main spreading center there in the Middle East was the, the, the growth of grain-based agriculture. And I, those of you who've read Jared Diamond's really great book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, know that in a way Jared's, Diamond's thesis is that, agri that, that geography is destiny. That it, the rise of grain agriculture and the, the Eurasian populations, the, the, the conqueror peoples who spread out across the entire globe, uh, it, not because of any innate superiority of Europeans, but that if you look at the other spreading centers of agriculture, they are on north-south running continents. And that means that if you move your food producing system very far out of your traditional area, you get into a climate that's not going to support your crops anymore. Bananas, yams, those sorts of things can't be grown well out of the tropics. So you, you don't move very far if you're on a continent that runs north-south. But Eurasia, running 8,000 miles east to west, means that you could move grain agriculture huge distances and still be in the same climate zone. So these were people who became, who moved to their culture over large distances and got used to it. The other thing about grain agriculture is that with yams or bananas or or even beans, you can just poke them into the ground and you know, clear a little tiny spot and grow them right there. With grain agriculture, you really need to clear a large area. You need to wipe out what is there and cultivate the soil very finely. And then there's a lot of processing involved as well. You don't just pick it out of the ground and eat it. You have to process it. So it brings with it a lot of technology, and it also means that you eliminate the existing ecosystem. It doesn't matter what's growing there when you're doing grain agriculture because you get rid of it. So that also allows it itself to spread. So agricultural people based on grain 
uh, spread over large distances. Grain agriculture is a very aggressive form of agriculture in that it's easy to spread, it's very portable, and it requires wiping out the existing ecosystem in order to do it. So it has some unusual characteristics. And another one is that it generates a storable surplus. You can store potatoes and things for a while, but grain you can store for many, many years. So I want to talk about what a storable surplus does when you have something that you can store over a long period of time. One thing is that you need technology to store it now. You need rat-proof, vandal-proof grain bins to keep the grain in. So you're starting to develop big technologies, grinding wheels, things like that. Um, but technologies to store it so you stop being quite as nomadic. You, you settle more. You need police to protect it because you've got a big store of valuable stuff. Granaries have traditionally been collective. Farmers bring their grains in collectively and pile them together. And so it's a big valuable crop that if there are hungry people nearby, you know, you've got to protect it. So you need police to start protecting the grain. You need a lord to parcel it out, someone to, kind of, to decide who gets what. And the, the origin of the word lord is really interesting. It's from the old English, two old English words, hlaf ward, which is loaf ward, or keeper of the loaves. So lord has its origin in the person who controls the grain. That's, that's the origin of that word, is that the, the guy who owns the grain really controls the show. So you need somebody to decide who gets it. You need accountants to measure it. You've got to start a number system. You know, you put in three pecks of grain, so you're going to get three pecks back. You start counting and numbering. You need laws to regulate. You know, how much did you bring in? How much do you get out? And when do you get it out? And have you been good enough to get it out? Uh, and you need punishment for those who disobey those laws. So the beginning of grain agriculture brings with it this huge cultural baggage. And it really is, in a way, you can think of it as the beginning of the police state. You need all kinds of regulations that were not there before. So, okay, so just let's say that we get this. Let's say that we understand that, you know, there's all this social and cultural baggage that comes along with agriculture. Let, what, what else is, is the problem then if we can fix those pieces? And so I want to look at a few other consequences of agriculture um, that, are, that are kind of inescapable. Um, the first is that my training is actually in biology. Before I was a permaculturist, I was a geneticist and a, and a biologist for about 20 years. And I know that when an organism finds a rich food source, they breed. It is a trigger for increased fertility in women, higher sperm counts in, in males. It's just, it's, it's biology. It's just what happens when you find a good food source. So farming, because it creates, agriculture creates an abundant food source, it's going to trigger breeding more people, and then more people need more food, and you get this positive feedback loop of larger, you know, more babies, got to clear more land for more people. So it's a positive feedback, self-reinforcing feedback loop that really can't be stopped very easily. Nobody likes population control. It is the third rail of, you know, of politics. You, just, you don't want to talk about population control. Grains are also very easily converted into calories. Meat, vegetables, things like that um, take a lot of energy to get energy back out of them, whereas grains are carbohydrate rich and they generate and they release their energy very easily. And it is the energy in food that triggers breeding. That's what, what brings on those high fertility rates. So they're easily converted into calories. So it's, it's a rich and abundant food source. Also, you can now make soft food for babies to eat so you can wean them much more early. That in hunter-gatherer societies, babies are not weaned until they're three or four when the jaw has developed to be able to grind up stuff, to eat meat and break up tubers and things like that. Whereas grain, you can make a porridge. Now you can wean children really young. Women who are nursing tend not to get pregnant. And the average birth interval in hunter-gatherer societies is three to four years or so whereas the average birth in, interval in agricultural societies is, is about as quickly as you can have babies. I was reading a biography of Theodore Roosevelt a while ago, and they pointed out that his grandmother on one side had 17 pregnancies, and on the other side his grandmother had 19 pregnancies. And that was pretty typical. Um, only a few lived to adulthood. That was the way it went. So in an agricultural society, you essentially have women pregnant from menarche to menopause. You know, 18, 20 pregnancies over the course of 20, 25 years or so. And that's going to really change women's role in society when, when you're pregnant for most of your adult life. 
So it, it transforms the culture. Um, and it means you're just going to have a much higher birth rate. It's an, an inescapable part of agriculture. We're also taught that when agriculture came along, people got much healthier because we now have an abundant food source. But it's actually a, a nutrient-poor food source. They now have these wonderful agricultural sites. There are at least 25 of them around the world where anthropologists and archaeologists have been able to trace the sequence of people from hunter-gatherer into deriving agriculture, the, the very same people in the same site moving into agriculture. And they have skeletal remains that they've been able to analyze, and so they know a lot about the health of people as they adopted agriculture. Uh, the first thing that happens is that lifespan drops by 20 to 30 percent. People die much younger once they move to agriculture. And that lifespan didn't come up again until the fossil fuel era. Uh, the average people died on average, um, the average age of, of death, the average lifespan was about 28 to 35 years up until the, the 1700s or so. Um, fossil fuels kind of powered us out of that. So a shorter lifespan, far more degenerative diseases. This woman here is an Egyptian woman grinding grain using something called a quern, where she is, it's a roller that you roll out on a dished rock. And basically you get down on the ground and you do this all day long. And that just makes my knees hurt right there. Uh, so degenerative diseases in the knees, the wrists, the neck, the back, uh, the ankles, from repetitive motion all day. In non-agricultural people, the principal cause of injury uh, is, is trauma, is you know, getting gored by something or falling out of a tree. Um, in agricultural people, it's degener degenerative diseases. Then epidemic diseases, most epidemics, not all, but many epidemics come from domesticated animals. Uh, smallpox from cattle, measles and mumps from, from pigs, chickenpox, um, there's a whole slew of them that come from domesticated animal. The particular, particularly v uh, virulent forms of, of bird flu come from poultry. So you see far more epidemics um, in agricultural people. People got shorter. The high, average height of both men and women dropped by about four inches once agriculture came along. And in many parts of the world, that has not recovered until the last 100 years or so. Um, people at these sites in Turkey, up until very recently, were the same height that their ancestors were 10,000 years ago, and shorter than their ancestors were 13,000 years ago. And then we're told that agriculture took care of famine, that now we have a storable food supply. It turns out that the opposite is really true, that foragers can almost always find food somewhere. Their population is much more in balance with their food supply, so during a bad year, they can still find food, whereas in an agricultural society, you're dependent on a surplus. And if you don't generate that surplus, you go hungry. There is a, a great historian who died a few years ago named Fernand Brodel, a Frenchman who was one of the first historians to study how regular people li live, not just the rulers, but he looked at birth records and church records and tax records and censuses and marriage licenses and things like that all through Europe. And he started looking at, at famine was one thing he looked at. And these are the numbers on major famines continent-wide, wiping out 10 to 20 percent of the population in Europe. Famine was a regular visitor up until the fossil fuel era. Uh, and famine does, is, is not that common on that scale in hunter-gatherer societies. And these are just the big famines. There are little you know, local famines, hundreds of them each century. Um, these are just the big continent-wide famines. So famine becomes a regular visitor with agriculture. Farming needs a lot of land, that it's not just the footprint of the cropland, but there's, you need land for fertility as well. Again, uh, fossil fuels have powered us out of this. But up until the 1800s or so, the average farmer would plant four acres for their grazing animals and for manure uh, and, the, and their animals to provide labor, four acres for every acre of cropland. And John Jevons uh, up in Northern California has been trying, looking at how much fertility you need in order to garden an area sustainably and has found that you need about four acres to grow compost crops to keep one acre perpetually in good fertility. So the, the footprint of agriculture is much bigger than just the, the human crop land. Plus you need land for mines, for fuel, for timber, all of those sorts of things. And you need land to, to take care of the workers. Uh, most agricultural systems have been based on slavery up until very recently. The majority of people have been either slaves or serfs. 
uh, in a feudal type of existence um, up until very recently with agriculture. So there's a lot less leisure and freedom for agricultural people that a, a forager really can find in two or three weeks work, they can gather enough food for a year in any reasonable environment, whereas agricultural people need to work a lot more than that. Uh, and usually you have to pay rent to the person who owns the land, um, which can be anywhere from one to four days a week, depending on what kind of a deal um, the, your lord is, is going to grant you. Farming societies have much less cultural diversity than hunter-gatherer societies and horticultural societies as well. That if you look at how the, the Inuit versus the San Bush people in Africa versus the Yanomamo in South America, how they live, they are so radically different, they don't even have words for what each other are doing. Whereas farming people are, I mean, there's, there's some diversity, but it's pretty recognizable from one farming culture to another. And industrial culture, there's only one, right? I mean, the, the McDonald's culture is pretty much the only allowable industrial culture. So you see a narrowing of diversity. And like I've said before, it's portable, so it lends itself to conquest. When we look at the spread of agriculture, it's not just agriculture that spreads, it's the agriculturists who spread. The genes move through the population. Um, and we certainly saw that in the most recent spread of of European agriculture into the New World. It's, it's, not, it's not a pretty picture when agriculture moves. And as I, as I said, agriculture generally uses slaves or serfs in order to keep it going. It needs a huge labor force um, until we got fossil fuels. Another facet of agriculture is that we move from instead of knowing that the wild is where our sustenance comes from, is that nature now becomes the en enemy. Nature is where the bad stuff comes from. So, so it creates this, this wild, tame dichotomy. And even the idea of wilderness, the word wild, um, the, the, the word bewildered means to be confused by, by nature, to be confused by the wild. And if you, if you think about what happens when a people believe that the wild is not where their sustenance comes from, and now, now we've, we've at least moved to a point where we think of the wild as sacred. Rather than something to be tamed and be eliminated, now we think of it as sacred. But there's this still huge divide. We don't belong in the wilderness. Right? We need to stay out of the wilderness, is what we're told. We, we're, it's not right for us to be there because we'll just wreck it. And what that means is that we're gradually going to shrink it. If we don't think of the wilderness as something that takes care of us, as something that provides for us, we're gradually going to shrink it, just like the Alaskan Wild National Wildlife Refuge, right? Hey, that's off limits. That's sacred land. We're going to leave that. Oh, wait, there's oil there. You know, that's, that's what we do. You, if, just to, to paraphrase Derek Jensen, who has said that if you think that the store and your job is where your sustenance comes from, you're going to fight to the death to support that system. If you think that wild nature is where your sustenance comes from. You're going to fight to the death to support that system. So it's a very different way of looking at the world. So in other words, agriculture is essentially the process of taking land that looks like this, you know, taking wild land. And first, traditionally, we would set fire to it. That's, nowadays, we clear it with machines. But this is actually, we're still doing this. This is a rainforest in Brazil that has been cleared to produce sugar cane for ethanol. And then we make it look like this. And that is not a wild ecosystem. There's, there's nothing wild in that landscape. There's no carbon sequestration to speak of. There's, there's no habitat. There's no abundance. There's no air cleaning and water cleaning and all the things that wild land does. Um, so agriculture is really, you know, we need to get rid of the ecosystem that was there and turn it into something that looks like that. And the feedback from that degradation is, is it's too slow for us to recognize. By the time the soil is gone, after 50 years or 200 years, we don't notice you know, that, it, that it's gone. Well, the soil's always been here. You know, it's always looked like this. So the feedback that we are degrading the ecosystem is too slow. If you're a forager and you over-harvest, you know it immediately. Whereas if you're an agriculturist, it can take you a century or two to realize that you have just eliminated the land's capacity to provide for you. And we could ignore it now because we have fertilizers and chemical fertilizers and, and all of that. So we don't, we don't listen to the feedback at all. So farming is essentially the process of turning ecosystems into people. That, that, we're, you know, that is a people landscape. That is not a, a, a wild landscape. Those are people in that landscape. 
So just to, to kind of sum up, like I said, we're going to go pretty negative, and we're just about at the nadir. So you know, put the razor blades away because we're you know we're going to we're going to come around again here. But just to, to kind of recap, a civilization based on on agriculture does all these things. You know, nature becomes the en enemy. We don't have ecosystems left. It's grounded in scarcity and fear. It's really hard work. We're not healthy in it. We get hierarchies because someone's got to control all this stuff. We have a tame, wild dichotomy. Uh, and it's generally promoted by the people who benefit from it. I haven't gone into that too much, but that's another aspect. Um, and it, in general, makes us very fearful. We're afraid of the wild and those wild people. So I'm, I've begun to think that some of this starts to explain, you know, these are some of my cultural icons, some of the people that I'm, that I, and, and the, the parts of our culture that I really treasure, of, of my own culture. Um, these, these marvelous creative geniuses who are doing tremendous work. But so we've got a culture that can do this. I mean, this is what we're capable of. It's wonderful. It's amazing stuff. And mostly we do this. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what you got. You know, this, this, is, this is what our culture really looks like. And, and what I'm coming to, to understand is that without that connection to wild nature, we go insane. You know, we lose our minds. I mean, these guys, that's the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and they don't look sane to me. You know? And, and how, how long can you remain sane in an environment like that? And why would you want to live in something where the air looks like that? We, we go insane if we're cut off from wild nature. So... <clears throat> Just to, to sum this up then, so I, I don't think there can be such a thing as sustainable agriculture in the long run. We've had a 10,000 year run with agriculture. It's been great in a lot of ways. We've learned a lot from it. But name one ecosystem that's better off for having agriculture come into it. You know, there aren't any. And the follow-up question to that is how long can we keep doing that? We've been doing it for about 10,000 years and we don't have another 10,000 years. I don't know if we've got another century. Of, of behaving like this. So this is where I start thinking about that other type of society called horticultural societies. That horticultural societies have been regarded as this brief transition state. That you're a hunter-gatherer for hundreds of thousands of years and then you learn to domesticate plants and animals and you're a horticulturalist for like a week and then you become a farmer. It's inexorable. You're going to become an agriculturist. But it, and that's been the assumption of anthropologists for a long time, is it's an unstable transition state between foraging and farming. It turns out that there are horticultural societies that are very stable, that have been around for many thousands of years. The Hopewell that I mentioned earlier had a highly advanced, wonderful culture. Mound builders doing beautiful art from Ohio to, to New Jersey, living there for at least 4,000 years in a horticultural way of life. Uh, another horticultural society were the Jomon of Japan, 14,000 years they were living there as horticulturists. That anthropologists are starting to reclassify an enormous number of cultures now that they thought were either foragers or farmers, and they're seeing that, no, there's this big middle ground in between. So these, the, the, Jomon, the Jomon tended these food forests. They, they tended plants and animals. They had little domestication, but mostly they were just favoring the wild stuff that they really liked. And just to, to let you know that these are not exceptions, there are a lot of horticultural societies that the Northwest Coast peoples uh, in North America are being reclassified as horticultural. You know, they tended camas, they tended the salmon. They didn't domesticate these, these plants and animals. They tended them, they took care of them and maintained the ecosystems that they were in. Uh, in ancient Oaxaca, there is a corn growing people that, yeah, they had some domesticated crops like corn, but they grew them in these unbelievable polycultures mixed with a lot of wild plants as well. There are the Nuwa'alu in Indonesia as a horticultural people that have been there for thousands of years. And then here in Southern California, the Kumaya'e and the Owens Valley Paiute uh, were originally thought of as, as foragers, but now they're seeing the amount of plant tending and animal tending that they were doing. So there are just, uh, there are lots and lots of horticultural peoples all over the world. So it's not a brief transition step. It's a stable way of making a living on the planet. The Amazon is starting to look like a giant food forest tended by horticultural people. They're finding much higher percentages of human friendly plants um, near major trails and near the rivers that were used as the, as the major traveling paths. 
and then the, the temperate in, in the temperate North America, all the major river valleys um, in this country, the, the Sacramento, the Mississippi, uh, the Ohio, um, were food forests before uh, the Europeans arrived here. Uh, if you look at the dominant tree species in the eastern North America that the early European explorers, uh, Verrazano, writing in the early 1500s, talks about these forests that are chestnuts, white oaks, which is a major food source, uh, white oak acorns, chestnuts, white oaks, walnuts, beech nuts, hickory nuts, with an understory of crab apples and cherries, uh, and, and, and set on fire regularly to clear uh, for, for travel and for game. These were, the continent was covered with giant food forests that fell apart when their keystone species, uh, the human beings who tended them, were eliminated. So what Thoreau and Emerson and the romantic poets were writing about with this dark, tangled wilderness, kind of scary, and you know, the, the, the wild, um, the, the forest primeval, was actually a collapsed food forest that had had a couple of hundred years to degrade into this tangled thicket where many of the major food producing species like the chestnut um, were, were dying off uh, and devolving into these, these degraded or falling apart thickets uh, because their keystone species, the native people, were gone. So I think of permaculture as a, a new type of horticultural society. We're not going to go back. You know, we're not going to go back to foraging or, hort or the old style of horticulture. That's not what human beings do. So I think of permaculture as a new approach to this. Uh, if you just, if, just to understand what I mean by horticulture, the word horticulture, the origin is hortus, uh, which is plant, as opposed to agar, which is field. So it's plant tending rather than field tending, which really changes your relationship. Uh, and, and really just, in, in brief, it's gardening rather than farming using small implements like hoes and digging sticks instead of uh, land terraforming devices like the plow that change the landscape. Usually it's in polycultures, small scale, uh, a, lot of, a lot of polycultures, and it encourages the natural process of succession. Grain agriculture is setting succession back every year. It's annual clear cutting where we, we plant an annual and then we harvest it all and we plant it again and, you don't allow succession to proceed, whereas horticulturalists, permaculturists love shrubs and trees. We want to integrate the later successionary stages into our food producing systems. And it can allow natural ecosystems to still function. The first time I really got this was when I was teaching a course in Belize and the farmer, the quote farmer across the river invited us over to come see his farm. And he did have a little patch of corn down on the river bank that got flooded twice a year which brought in new fertility to it and he didn't need to water it. But he took us to his house and it was surrounded by jung jungle. I mean, there, he pointed out the jaguar tracks right by his front door that had gone by the night before. There were morpho butterflies with eight inch wingspans flapping around. There were trogons and amazing birds hanging out in the trees. And he said, how do you like my farm? And I was like, I don't see a farm, I see a jungle. And then my eyes got used to it and I realized, wait a minute, that's a mango. That's a tamarind, that's citrus, those are bananas, those are coffee bushes, those are medicinal, those are nitrogen fixers. Ooh, that's a cacao tree with a vanilla bean twining up it, so you got a chocolate vanilla guild there. <laughs> and I realized everything that he had planted was behaving like an ecosystem, that this was a, a wild food forest that was generations old and yet it allowed jaguars and trogons and morpho butterflies. So, so this is possible, this is what we can do, is we can create ecosystems where we're just one of the species that benefit from it, rather than the only species that benefits from it. The horticultural societies tend to have much flatter hierarchies. You're usually able to get a hold of whoever the boss is, um, whereas, you know, it's hard to get a meeting even with the mayor, let alone Obama, um, in our society. So the hierarchies tend to be much flatter. And, and this was actually what got me started about this whole line of thought a bunch of years ago, is that I noticed that in permaculture courses, it's not quite as true as it was, because permaculture's broadened a bit, but I noticed that many of the participants, although they came from a Judeo-Christian background mostly, um, the way that I do, that they kept talking about you know, Mother Earth and the Earth Goddess and Earth Spirits and you know, communing with the, the dev devas and and all of this, and, and I just kept thinking, okay, what is it about permaculture that is attracting all these pagans? What is, what is the deal? And 
And what I've come to understand is that most agricultural societies, and there are exceptions for sure, but most agricultural societies tend to locate their deity in the sky, and heaven is up there somewhere. And most horticultural and foraging societies tend to locate spirit here on earth. That, you know, it, it is a mother earth and father sky. And, you know, the trees have spirit and the animals have spirit and everything's got spirit. And agricultural people tend to think of human beings as the chosen. You know, we are the, at best, stewards of the earth and often it's dominion over the earth. Whereas horticultural and foraging people tend to think of humans as just another creature with spirit like everybody else. So it, it really is a question of earth spirits versus sky gods is one of the dichotomies that occur. So it's a very different relationship with spirit and with the planet. So just to look at permaculture a bit, one of the things that really attracted me to permaculture is its ethical basis, that we have three ethics in permaculture that before we do anything we ask, does it care for the earth? Is what we're planning on doing going to care for people? And what are we going to do with all the yield from it? Because when you take care of the earth, she is so abundant and amazing that she generates more than you need. And the same with people. We're so creative and incredible that when we're, we're allowed to live without fear, we innovate. We do really cool stuff. So you have to figure out something to do with what you get from it. You know, what do you do with that surplus? You give it back to the systems that, that gave it to you. The, the problem is, you know, what surplus, right? You know, when do, how do I know what's extra? What if I need it? You know, how many times have I taken something to goodwill and then go, ah, you know, the next day, ah, I wish I still had that. It's just, surplus is, is, a, is an iffy area in, in our culture. It's hard to know what a surplus is because we live in a culture that's grounded in scarcity. That is our ethic. One of the definitions of economics, if you, if you look up the definitions, one of them is the allocation of scarce resources among competing interests. So right there in the definition, it's like it's scarce and we're fighting over it. Whereas if I look at nature, you know, you take a few cuttings off of a plant, you pot them up, and suddenly you've got hundreds of plants. I don't see scarcity out there when I look at nature. I see abundance. And that is what permaculture is about, is we're grounding ourselves in the abundance model rather than the scarcity model. You know, that, that is our model, is these highly productive, amazing, beautiful, diverse systems that we can just be a part of. A little tweaking, a little learning about them and understanding them, and they are wildly productive for us. So I want to look at a few permaculture strategies then, just a few cool things that we do in permaculture um, that, that give me some encouragement. Now, one of the main things about permaculture is that we understand that life creates conducive conditions conducive to more life. It just makes things better. You know, when you put life into place, it gets richer and more abundant and more lush. And that's what we're trying to do. Permaculture has a set of principles that we've extracted from nature. I know many of you are familiar with permaculture and its principles. And one of my favorites is catch and store energy and materials. In other words, we are awash in flows of energy and materials, water and air and food and nutrients and all kinds of things going by us all the time. Urban resources, just amazing what you've got. And nature learns to catch and store these, to catch them and use them to build more storage. Just the way a tree grows. You plant a little seed, it puts out a couple of little leaves, harvests some sunlight, uses that energy to build more, uses that energy to build more, and just gets better over time. So uh, one of my favorite examples of catch and store energy is I was invited to do a course in the Bahamas a few years ago, and it was in a little peninsula uh, that stuck out into the ocean, and they couldn't have a conventional septic system because it, the soil, well, there wasn't soil. It was just ground up coral. There was no life in it. So the effluent from a septic system would just basically go straight into the ocean without any treatment at all. So we decided to build a black water treatment system. So we dug these, the, they dug these concrete lagoons, these concrete pits that the septic tank from each dormitory would run into. The toilets would flow into the septic tank and then the septic tank would flow into these two concrete lagoons. And then we took ground up coral and packed it into the lagoons and then planted into it. And this is what it looked like the day that it was planted. And that's what it looked like three months after it's planted. So you're looking at, you know, tropics, so it's warm, plus we're giving it plenty of water, plus there are nutrients in the form of human waste that the bacteria and plants in the system are really happy to work with. So there it is three months after it was planted. 
and there it is three years after it was planted. But this is what this does, is it's, it's turning shit into something wonderful. <laughs> and what's, what's great here is there's no smell, it's a delightful place, it's full of birds and butterflies, it's 10 degrees cooler, it's a wonderful windbreak from the constant ocean gales that are coming across, and, and it's, it's a delightful place to be. It's where everybody hangs out now, next to these two sewage lagoons. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. So that's what we can do when we pay attention to what's going by us. Another of my favorite permaculture principles is finding places to make a minor intervention, a small change that will yield a big effect. And I, I spent six years up in Portland, so lots of, lots of my examples are from Portland. And this was a project done by a group called City Repair, a, a genius architect named Mark Lakeman, who lived on an intersection and got to know all of his neighbors. He'd been there for, for pretty much all of his life. Got to know all of his neighbors, and they thought, wouldn't it be cool to turn this intersection into a village? You know, let's, let's get a traffic circle. So they went to the city and said, we want a traffic circle to slow down traffic. And the city said, well, there are two ways to get a traffic circle. You pay us 10,000 bucks and we'll build one. Or if there's a fatality at the intersection, you can have one. So they looked for volunteers. <laughs> so they, they regrouped and thought, well, why don't we just paint a traffic circle? We've got good artists. We can paint an optical illusion of a traffic circle. And then it kind of took off from there. They thought, well, you know, on my corner, I'd like to put a little free box, kiosk, information booth, you know, a little library and giveaway box. Uh, and someone, the, another person said, well, I want to build a children's PlayStation on my corner. And another person said, I'd, I'd like to make a cafe. I'm willing to, to bring out hot water every morning and put it in a thermos that's chained to this post and put a table up. And we can put old cups out there and we can have coffee in the morning. And it just went on with everyone wanting to do something at each corner of the intersection. So they took this proposal, this, this model here, to the city and said, this is what we want to do. And the city just went, we don't have a permit for that. And besides, it's public property, so you can't use it. Um, you know, just going on. But, but there was someone in the Department of Transportation who overheard this and said, you know, I like this idea. And yeah, I, we don't have permits for this kind of thing. I can't give you a permit for that. But I can give you a permit for a block party, close off the intersection for the weekend. And if something happens, you know, with this idea of, of like Joel said yesterday, better to ask forgiveness than permission. So that's what they did. And they built this, you know, they had this wonderful experience of just putting this together, all the neighbors getting together, kids coming by to help out. They actually, they recognized being pattern literate, they understood that this was attractive and was going to get vandalized if they weren't careful. So they went around the neighborhood and got all the 12 to 14 year old boys and brought them over and got them involved in the project so that the future vandals all had a stake in it then. So it's been left alone, it's been taken care of. And because of this, now neighbors further down the street started putting benches in their front yards and planting gardens in their front yards. I mean, really inviting strangers to sit in your yard on a bench, you know, amazing thing. There are now 34 of these and growing in Portland. They, there is now an, an ordinance. The mayor came by because someone in the DOT saw this thing and said, you know, you vandalized city property and we're going to sandblast it, we're going to charge you for it, and we're going to rip it all out. And they brought the mayor by who looked at it and said, no, let me get this straight. You're slowing down traffic. You're creating beauty. You're creating community. You're probably raising property values because this is really cool. You're lowering insurance rates because there's going to be less theft here. She just went on and ticked off all of these things that she said. These are all things that Portland is trying to do. And it didn't cost the government anything. So now there is an intersection repair ordinance in Portland where if you get Certain, you go through certain criteria, you can do this. And there are now 35 of these and, and growing in Portland. And they're branches of this outfit, City Repair. CityRepair.org is the group that's doing this. Uh, and you can get their handbook on how to do it and what the political process is and how to work with your neighbors and how to build alliances and get momentum for it. So make a little change of just wanting to have a traffic circle. And it turned into a community. Another piece that I think we need to look at is the self-sufficient dream. You know, when I started permaculture, I moved to the country because I wanted to grow all my own food. And I wanted to get back to the land. And I, and I hear this a lot. A lot of people come up to me, and I totally get it. They say, I want to grow all my own food on my own property. How, how can I do that? And I just started thinking about that. It's kind of a weird thing to want to do it all yourself. And I, I think that 
that we have this heritage in the US that's a very odd one of the way that the country was settled with the rugged individualists you know, moving west and, and having to prove a piece of land. You, you got your section of land and you had to demonstrate that you alone could make a living on it and make improvements in it. So we have this, this weird history because pe traditionally people have moved as communities. You know, have grown as families and tribes in places. And the US was developed as real estate. So we have a really different relationship um, here in this country. So, and, and if, you, if you look at this, you know, nowadays, the way land is carved up, I mean, our, our property boundaries are not ecological boundaries. They're drawn up by planners and realtors and developers. And there's no reason that this should become your ecosystem boundary. Why would you choose to grow all your own food in your own land? You know, what, is it, what is it that makes us want to do that? Because I get it. I have felt it myself. And if you, if you even look at the vocabulary, it's like, I want to grow all my own food on my own property, right? So there's, there's not a lot of sharing going on here. I think really, like in permaculture, we move to the highest generalization. What are we really asking when we, when we say this? What is it we're really trying to do? And I think really it's that we want to meet our food needs in a way that we can believe in and we figure we default to, so I have to do it all myself. But, but I, so I think really if we want to examine this, it's much more about community self-reliance and regional self-reliance and how do we do this as a community? How do we make sure that we're supporting the kind of food system that we want to see in the world? And permaculture I think offers a very nice tool, a bunch of tools for doing this that one of them uh, is called the zone system, where a zone, zone simply mean plant the stuff, you put the stuff that you use a lot nearest to where you are in zone one. Stuff you use all the time, put that in zone one, and that can be your garden or your desk. You know, my laptop is right in my zone one. My files are over there in zone two. The reference books I hardly ever use, they're over there in zone three. This is the zone system in permaculture. And it can help us understand the food shed by placing the parts of our food shed that we need the most often closest to us. So in other words, zone one in a food shed would be your own garden, if you are a gardener. If you're not a gardener, then don't worry about that. But if you like to garden, then you grow the stuff that makes sense for you to garden, as much of it is, as is reasonable for you, and meet a certain amount of your food needs that way. And then if you can't meet all your food needs in your zone one, then you've got neighbor's gardens and community-supported agriculture and community gardens you know those really well. You can go to those gardens, you can see them, you can influence the practices there. So that's your zone two. Meet as many of your food needs as you can in zones one and zone two. We've shrunk our food shed, right? Instead of being the whole planet, which our food shed is now, you know, we're shrinking it. That's, that's the idea. So that we get more control and more understanding over our food source. We have food we can believe in. Then if you can't meet all your food needs in zones one and two, then farmer's markets where you may not actually see the farm, but you can talk to the farmers, you can talk to the people there. So you can have a lot of influence over how it is grown and you can understand it and believe in it. And then if you can't move, meet all your food needs that way, then there are regional grocery stores, places that, that focus on local or focus on sustainable, equitable, socially just practices, and we can believe in those and we can shop there. And you ought to be able to meet all your food needs in those four zones without much problem. You know, but if you can't, okay, that's when you sneak into Costco and hope that you know, your green friends don't see you or that, that sort of thing. But zone five is considered the wild area that we hardly ever visit, and that's, that, it, it applies to this too. But this is where permaculture is really a toolkit. It's a decision-making process. It's a set of tools for figuring out what techniques, what strategies to use. There's so many ways of getting food, and permaculture helps us work our way through that maze and arrive at a set of solutions that make sense for us. Another piece I'm getting really encouraged about is food sovereignty laws these, these days. Just the idea that you have the right as a consumer to get whatever you want. And if a farmer grows something and you agree with that farmer what you're going to have, you know, how it's going to be, you, you know, like, like what Joel was saying yesterday, this agreement not to sue each other. You know, just in, that, that is a truly free market where you can buy raw milk if you want, where you can get locally pastured meat. With, without the state intervening. And there are a lot of communities now that are coming up with food sovereignty laws where they're saying the state and the feds have no right to regulate our food system if we among ourselves agree upon it. 
And I know it's going to get tested in the Supreme Court at some point, but to me it's a very encouraging trend. Another is, is money that is tied to something real instead of the crazy system we've got now, of money that's tied to, to hours of work or to local resources. And also restoring those parts of the economy that don't depend on money. So much of our economy has been monetized. You know, it used to be that when you got old, your kids took care of you, and then you could take care of their kids. You know, grandma and grandpa took care of the little kids. Now we've split all that up so that when you get old, somebody's got to pay for you in the retirement home, and your parent, your, your kids and their kids, now you know, we have to pay for daycare for our children because grandma and grandpa are shipped off somewhere. We've monetized the whole community care system. So finding ways to bring back that in, informal economy which has been principally work done by women for a very long time, which has been completely undervalued. Um, and I'm kind of glad it hasn't been turned into money. Let's not turn everything into money. To create a system of, of money flow and development that's locally controlled. When, when a development like this goes up, when you build 100 houses or 500 or 5,000 houses or whatever, we know that in the neighborhood they are now going to put in you know, big box stores and you know, all the other stuff that comes along, grocery stores, you know, home desk pots, um, coffee shops. I'll bet that somewhere in there, there's somebody who knows how to run one of these stores. So why don't we know that this pattern is going to unfold and build this stuff that's owned by the local community, rather than having all of our resources shipped in from far away and all of our money go out to far away. So just understand these flows, this pattern literacy. This is a pattern. So we know it. So let's, let's work with it so that we have local, local control. This permaculture on the community scale is really what I'm talking about. Uh, one of, another really encouraging trend is the appearance of public food forests. Uh, the one that's getting the most press now is the Beacon Hill Food Forest up in Seattle, which is it's being billed as the nation's first public food forest. And I'm not sure if it's the first, but it's certainly one of the biggest. And this has been this incredible project that came out of a permaculture design course where it was just going to be a theoretical project, although they found a real park in Seattle in the Beacon Hill neighborhood, one of the most ethnically and culturally diverse neighborhoods in the city. And they got buy-in from all the neighbors who said, we would love to have a food forest here. So over the last three years, it has made its way through city government and working with all the neighbors. And there is now being installed a, a huge public food forest. Uh, and it's interesting, the woman who, who helped set up the project, Jenny Pell, said that the, the biggest objection that they get instantly from people is, what if someone steals all the fruit? <laughs> and, I mean, that would be great, right? It would show an interest. It means we need more of them. So it's, it's this perceived impediments that actually turn out to be wonderful things. You know, if, if someone steals all the fruit, which really doesn't happen, uh, but then let's plant more. Clearly we need more if someone's taken it all. And food forests on city streets. This is the architect Mark Lakeman that I mentioned before, the founder of City Repair. Um, his office on a, on a busy street in Portland, uh, surrounded by a food forest. So this is, this is what we can create for, for passers-by. I was involved in a project, one of my design courses in Sonoma County, uh, went to the, the Sonoma County Jail, that has a very modest gardening project, and said, we would love to do a, a permaculture design for the jail. And they were just thinking it was theoretical, and we would just kind of you know, make up a design. But the, the jail authorities got really, really interested in this. And so now there is be, the beginnings of a permaculture design for the entire jail property going on. So permaculture is getting in with local government getting in with, with communities and doing these really, really wonderful projects. And even just small stuff, like a compost bin out on the street corner. This was a group of neighbors who didn't have enough compost themselves to build one bin, so they got together and built a compost bin out on, out on the, the right-of-way, out on the, um, the parking strip. And now neighbors walk by and, oh, you're composting. That's cool. What's that? You know, the, the important piece there is to put signs on it. I'm, I'm a big one on signage, let people know what's going on. So this just has the instructions for using the compost bin and why it's there. Um, just let people know what's going on. And I couldn't, I couldn't help but put this up. Someone, you know, speaking of good signage, you know, there's a daylily uh, and just reminding folks that it's edible. You know, you can, this is actually food. So. And then I think about peasant foods, just what, what is our, our indigenous cuisine? You know, I mean, here in California, we can grow so much that, uh, you know, it's probably wine and cheese is our, is our peasant food. But, 
but the, the evolution of peasant foods that are, that are inexpensive, easily available, readily grown foods in a region, are like, like polenta has a social history. It became the peasant food in Spain because the farmers had to give all their wheat to the landlord. The high value crops went to the landlord. The, the landlord didn't want the corn. You know, it was just, that was, that was peasant food. So polenta became the crop, the food that they could grow, uh, the one that they didn't have to give away. So, so what can we come up with real, you know, with our indigenous food? What is, what is our indigenous food here? What, what is something that's easy to grow and there's lots of it and it's fun to eat and we can have big parties around it? You know, that's what I think of when I think of peasant food. It's a great meal with a bunch of friends. Community seed saving workshops are a ton of fun, another way to build community, really simple. Um, adults love them because they get to trade cool seed varieties. Kids love them because they get to make a mess. So this is another part of the toolkit for creating local abundance and local community. And community tool saving, tool lending libraries, where you know, I, I have a 20-foot extension ladder I, you know, twice a year for my gutters. That's all I ever use it for. That's crazy. Why, why do I own something like that? You know, there are a lot of tools that you only use once or twice. And, and cities themselves are now starting to sponsor public tool lending libraries. And again, the big objection, for the first objection, the perceived impediment is what, you know, what if someone steals them? What if they break? It's like, well, okay, let's just forget about it and not do it, right? You know, let's give up. Um, just build in a small fee for breakage and theft. It's like, okay, now the problem is solved. Let's, let's move on. So that's really what permaculture is, is what are the perceived impediments? How do we remove them before they even come up? What is the pattern that we're gonna go through? So tool lending libraries. And education that actually means something. I, I work with an amazing teacher named Michael Becker who's in the Hood River, Oregon school system. And he took a permaculture design course about 15 years ago and said, I am changing my whole curriculum and I'm gonna teach math, science, history, geography through permaculture. And his kids now, they, they're out in the garden a good bit but they're not just gardening, they're doing experiments, they're learning about different cultures, you know, they're looking at the food of different cultures. They, these 6th, these 7th, and 8th graders prepare meals. They dress up in the dress of a different culture. They prepare the food of that culture. They invite the parents uh, and the rest of the school in to eat it. Um, he did, I, I could just go on and on for hours about what these kids do. They designed a lead platinum building uh, that, that won the AIA's award of one of the 10 most sustainable buildings put up uh, in 2010. The kids designed it. The kids installed solar panels. The kids have built an aquaponic system in the greenhouse. The kids give tours of the school. The kids have raised a quarter of a million dollars themselves um, to build a uh, music and science studio. I mean, it's just, it's incredible what these, I mean, these, these kids are doing things that most adults don't consider themselves capable of. So this is what our education system can be with, with permaculture. And then just to, to begin to wrap up with just how do we do this, just things that I've learned about strategies. Permaculture really works at the level of strategies, not recipes, not techniques, but what's our plan? How do we put a plan together and then choose the techniques that we're going to be using? And so just in permaculture, we always begin with observation. What do we got out there? Let's observe and see what we have. What's our resource base? What's available to us in the way of land and physical resources? What skills and technologies have we got? You know, get this inventory together of what, what are our resources for doing things? A really important one is who's going to help us? Who, who's going to be friendly? Who, who can we get on board really, really easily? To identify those folks and, and create these alliances that will help us with our projects. And as I've said several times, you know, what are the perceived obstacles? We know what they're going to be. We know the objections people are going to come up with. We know where the scarcity is going to come in. We know where the bottlenecks are. Just Figure those out. There are going to be some that you don't spot, but we know where the obvious ones are. And then start with projects you know that you can get a win on. Don't pick the hardest thing to start with. Pick an easy one that will build momentum. Get the low-hanging fruit first, and that'll give you enough energy and resources to work on the harder stuff. Uh, and identify the people who are making policy. Who are the folks that you really need to get to? How can you make friends with them, or how can you make friends with their friends? Now, how do we create momentum to get these things going? So these have been my processes for trying to move really cool policies through, you know, through the bureaucracy, um, through the neighborhood, uh, just getting people on board for these things. So just to, to 
assemble all of these things. In permaculture, a lot of folks come to permaculture through food. The garden gate is, is often the entryway to permaculture. But what we've learned over the years is that the same rules that apply for creating a, a regenerative, ecologically sound garden also apply to all the other basic human needs. That we can design food systems, we can design energy, water, you know, go around the whole wheel, go around the whole permaculture flower, including the needs, the invisible structures that we talk about, like security or culture and education and, and a more just legal system. We go around this wheel, and I think with, with everyone in this room, you know, we could probably find people who are working on some of these things on the personal level right now, working on you know, personal food security, we could probably find people in this room who are working on, say, regional energy policy or community energy policy, uh, and then regional legal issues. You know, we, have, we, we go around this wheel, and I'll bet we could meet all of our needs based on the people that are in this wheel, in, in this room. We could come up with, with the answers. You know, they're all here. So this is, this is why I love permaculture. It is a set of solutions that you can apply to anything. It's a decision-making tool that applies to any kind of design. Okay, so I'd like to think um, that at this point we have come a long way from the doom and gloom um, about the domestication of, of human beings by agriculture that I started with and, and all that we lost through that. Because when, uh, I, when, I, when I think about the profound freedoms that we lost when we became domesticated, it, it, it breaks my heart. You know, we, we, we can be a lot freer than we are. And, and we've, we've lost an awful lot for the seeming security that we have. It was really quite a trade. So I think we need to remember that we paid a, a price for this. You know, the freedoms that we gave up to, to live this way are, are really profound. Um, but in permaculture, permaculture says we start where we are, and this is where we are, right? We're in this place, you know, this culture right now. So I think that permaculture offers a roadmap from where we are now to a world in which we're directly connected to spirit to one in which we understand that it's not the store and the job that, that provide for us and, and nurture us, but it's the land and the air and the water and the plants and the animals that, that support us and that we in turn can support them. And I, I think our task really is to redesign civilization because the rest of the world out there, the more than human world is is depending on us to do that at this point. It's waiting for us to, to really re-envision our relationship with them. And so we've, I'd, I'd like to think that, that what permaculture offers us then is a toolkit where we can start to envision a world that's grounded not in scarcity but in abundance and that, that is really helps us generate a culture that's not based on fear, but that's, that's really based on love and empowerment. And when we look at this, then we can understand that, that we have, you know, that we belong here and that we have enough. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, just a quick plug for a program we're doing in Northern California, um, in Sonoma County. Uh, essentially just training ecological landscapers from soup to nuts. Get people out the door with business plans, the ability to read contracts, run heavy equipment, do design work. It's a nine-month program that we're putting together at the Permaculture Skills Center. Um, we've got some material on it out there, and you can talk with folks about it. Um, and I really enjoy being here, and thank you all, and we'll turn things over to Jeff Lawton.